the First World War came to an end in the month of November, uh, and um, ever since then, the church began, I think, the three masses, the custom of saying three masses on the 2nd of November began after the First World War, precisely because so many soldiers were dead without many masses for them, and therefore the possibility was given to priests to celebrate three masses for the dead on, from then on. And that, kind of mass, that kind of custom continues through to today. And in England, I don't know if it's in other, in other countries the same, but on this November, it was Sunday of November, uh, the mass is said also for the soldiers who died in the two world wars. It's worth thinking for a few moments from the point of view of our religion about those two world wars. Of course, these soldiers, most all, nearly all, died for love of their country. They, they died both, on both sides of let's, the First World War and the Second World War. They died thinking that they were fighting for their country, convinced they were fighting for their country, and they laid down their life for their country. Uh, our Lord spoke to an Italian, see, I think Beata Cons Consoli, a name like that, an Italian, a privileged soul in Italy, who, uh, Beata, I forget, her name doesn't matter. Uh, our Lord, she, she, on close terms with our Lord, was able to, come, to say to him, Lord, how can it be that so many good young men, and she's speaking for Italians, uh, good young men are dying now, and our Lord's reply was, Lucky, more, more or less, I'm, I, I can't say it as elegantly, as correctly as our Lord would say it, but the, the sense was this, uh, they're lucky to have died giving their lives for their country. They will go to heaven. Whereas if they survived into the peace, and you and I know what the peace of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 20s, uh, 2000s, 2010s, you and I know what corruption has been in those two in those, all of those years. And our Lord said, lucky for them, they died giving their souls, for their, giving their lives for their country. They would have been able to save their souls, whereas if they had survived into the peace, it's very possible they would go to hell. And you and I know how many young men are, have been and are on the road to hell ever since the Second World War. There were years of grace from 45 to 50, but from 90, more or less from 1950 onwards, for instance, 45 to 50, you may remember, the statues of Our Lady of Fatima were circulating everywhere, and the doves accompanied the statue of Our Lady, you may remember, in a miraculous fashion. Nobody else, nobody except God can control the doves. And God brought the doves in homage to the feet of the statues of Our Lady of Fatima to show souls. And souls, immediately coming out of the Second World War, deserved that. There was some real religion in those, uh, some real Catholicism, precisely because war had struck reality back into people's lives. Peace creates the fantasy we have today, endless peace with too little suffering. Strange things I say, but endless peace with too little suffering means people grow soft and corrupt, and they need the terrible discipline of war in order to come back to reality. The, the, the return to reality after the Second World War lasted, let's say, until about 1950. There were five good years, and from then on, it was, it was downhill all the way. It was downhill from, from 1950. The definition, maybe the turning point, it was the definition of the Assumption of Our Blessed Lady in Heaven in 1950 by Pope Pius XII. And from then on, the, second, the last part of the reign of, some, of, Pope, of Pope Pius XII was not as good as the first part of his reign. He, he, he didn't give nearly as much attention in the second part of his reign to Our Lady of Fatima. It seems that he was persuaded that Our Lady of Fatima wasn't that important. In any case, he never performed the consecration of Rafa which was needed, which Our Lady asked for. And from the 19, from his death, he, he Pius XII, upheld a great deal. He held the church a great deal um, against sliding until he died. Some people say he was poisoned. In any case, from the 1960s onwards, it was just headlong into Vatican II and the consequences of Vatican II 
which we've seen since the dissolution of the Catholic Church, the destruction of the Catholic Church, the slide of the Catholic Church. In any case, uh, the Second World War and the First World War, who did they profit? Who did they really profit? They profited the young soldiers who died for their country, convinced, persuaded and convinced, that they were doing a noble thing. And in their own minds, they were doing a noble thing. They were giving their lives for their country. They were prepared to lay down their lives, and of course many of them did. And they were on the side of the Germans as well, on the, side of the, on the side of the Russians, on the side of the Germans, on the side of the Americans, all of them, on all sides. Um, Almighty God says in Scripture, it's in um, the Epistle of James, war is the punishment for our sins. And therefore, it, it's, again, this is worth thinking about, that the sins of the first, before the First World War deserved the First World War with about 15 or 16 million dead. The sins in between the wars deserve the Second World War, 66 million dead, is the figure often quoted. If the sins before the First World War and between the wars, periods which now look like picnics, compared with what the corruption going on today, if those deserve those two terrible world wars, what kind of a punishment does 1945 through to today deserve by way of war? It's coming. It's going to come. Uh, and it will be a punishment from God. And again, the young Englishmen will lay down their lives, God bless them, and let's all thank them in advance. Let's thank them in advance. The Russians will lay down their lives, the Americans, the, again, once again, plenty of young men will lay down their lives. And then, of course, the, the, the plenty of civilians, if they start throwing around atom bombs and hydrogen bombs and heaven knows what, because of our sins, because of our sins, uh, many, many, many other souls are going to die as well. It's as though from then on the church would have to say every priest is entitled to, to say ten masses on the 2nd of November. Of course it won't do that because that's ridiculous. But it's just to say that if the First World War merited that the church should say three masses, the priest should say three masses on All Souls Day, after the Third World War it's going to be off the charts. It looks like being off the charts. What were the First and Second World Wars about? Essentially, punishments from God. Punishments for a Europe in particular sliding away from God already before the First World War. Like the French Revolution, many people before the French, few people to, to, that I know of, very few people before the French Revolution saw what horrors were in store and just around the corner. 90, 1788, France in peace, la douce of France, the, the lovely life in France, the gentleness of the of centuries and centuries of, 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 of the faith, and then 1794, the horrors of the terror. It, and where did these monsters come out, come out of? What, what happened? Answer, people were not living in contact with God. And the reality of what was going on, let's say in 1788, the reality was a lack of true religion, or of true religion in depth, which meant that in the depths of men, horrors were brewing, which the church wasn't getting at, wasn't able to get at, didn't think of getting at. Men were not seeing things with the eyes of God. Had they been seeing things with the eyes of God, they would have, they, there would be many more on their knees to, 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 to turn away the horrors of the French Revolution. They would have seen the horrors coming, Maybe a few souls did, but probably not many. And if, they, and if those souls who saw said something, they were discounted, like in the time of Noah. You may remember in Scripture says in the time of Noah, right up until the flood, they were being born, being married and dying, and going on as though life was completely normal, and then suddenly the flood struck. Noah had warned them. They must have known about this. All over the world, they, all over the people world, I'm sure everybody knew about this crazy man building this huge ark. What a silly man, what craziness. It's going to be a huge rainstorm. He's ridiculous. <laughs> he was right and they were all wrong. If anybody before the French Revolution had said, there are horrors just around the corner, people would have said, he's crazy. He's, he's, 
he's out of his little mind. If anybody before the First World War had said, there are any moment now going to be the horrors of trench warfare, if anybody had said before the Second World, before the First World War, there are going to be horrors of, the, of these, these brave young men torn to pieces by shells in agony in the hospitals, and there's going to be millions of them, people would have said, you're crazy. The mud baths, the, the blood and mud baths of the front, and so on and so on and so on. Second World War, I'm sure the same thing. Well, Second World War, people were a little more used to the idea of, of horrors, and they were kind of immunized in a way. But in the Edwardian age, they weren't ready for any such thing. It was a, a call to reality, a recall to reality. And the world was never the same again. Earl Grey, the, the, the Foreign Secretary here in England, said at the time, uh, when war broke out, the First World War broke out, he said, the, war, the lights are going out all over Europe and they're not going to be lit again in our generation. That was the statesman who had some idea of what, what it meant, this outbreak of war. You may remember that a couple of months later, or a few weeks later, Pius X died of a broken heart because he had, he had, he had seen it coming. He saw it coming, because he was seeing things with the eyes of God, with God through God's eyes. He had, he had God's way of looking at things, and therefore he understood what was coming. But um, today again, you can speak about the Third World War, the Third World War coming, the horrors that are going to come, the need to get down on our knees, the need to consecrate Russia to uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the need to pray, to pray, to pray. And people take it seriously to a certain extent, but things are still too comfortable for many people to understand what horrors are just around the corner. We need to see things the way Almighty God sees them. And if we see them that way, then the, the, the horrors going on in the church, the, 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 the sins, sins amongst human beings, for instance, every sin is a sin against God. Every sin is firstly a sin against God, a secondly a sin against self, and thirdly, only thirdly, a sin against neighbor. But even the sins, the serious sins between human beings against neighbor, are nothing compared with the sins which are directly against God. The scorn of his religion, the falsification of his church, the slide of the churchman, the failure of the churchman to see what is the truth, and if they see it, to tell what is the truth. So the people are warned, and so that the sheep can, can prepare themselves and get down on their knees and pray to help to avert the horrors that are hanging over our heads. How much is there of that? Not enough, not anything near enough. Of course there are bishops and priests and souls uh, that, that are praying and are aware of the danger. Today we remember, and remember all in your prayers during this Mass, remember the many souls, uh, these many young men that, that died on the front, at the front. Some of them not knowing, absolutely not knowing what it was all about. Again, from, from, the, from the standpoint of God, we think of, for instance, Father Willie Doyle, an Irish chaplain amongst the Irish soldiers on the front, fighting on the side of the Allies fighting on the side of England and France, fighting on the side of uh, the Empire, if you like, uh, and uh, going to the front, fighting bravely, the Irish are brave. Uh, you may remember what Dick Wellington once said, um, somebody complained to him that his Irish soldiers were mad. He said, well, if they're mad, I wish that the dog that bit them would bite the rest of my soldiers, said Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, because that was a very useful madness, the courage of the Irish soldiers. There they were at the front, fighting, and Willie Doyle was saving many, many souls, hearing the soldiers' confessions before they went under the shells, and many of them, of course, never came back. And finally, Willie Doyle himself was blown away, Father Willie Doyle was blown away by a shell himself, at the moment chosen by God. God uses war, and uses the death, and uses the threat of death, many, many, many young men, as I've also suggested to the Italian sister, many, many, many young men are in the trenches, with the shells whining over their heads, many will have thought of their last things, many will have thought of dying, many will have gone to confession to the chaplain when he came round before they went over the top and got killed. 
So God can make use of these events. Death and, and eternity. Whereas in peace, in this corrupt peace, people can, with the marvellous hospitals and with the means of looking after all kinds of illness, and putting off death, putting off death, putting off death, people still have to die, even if they go to hospital ten times and get miraculously saved by the hospitals ten times, they're still going to have to die. People don't want to think about that. They don't want to think about death, they don't want to think about old age. The old people are pushed off into old age homes where they're out of sight and out of mind. Well, maybe we go and visit them from time to time. Poor things, poor things. It's wrong. There's something wrong. There's something very wrong. Because the grandchildren have got a lot to give to the grandparents. The grandparents have got a lot to give to the grandchildren. And to push the old people away. Because nobody wants to think of old age. Nobody wants to think of dying. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to submit to that reality, which is death, old age and death, and illness and so on. Well, when you're, in your, when you're in the trenches in the war, you have to think about those things. You're bound to think about those things. Unless you're still defying God, even when you're on the very brink of death. And undoubtedly some soldiers were like that as well. Heaven help us. Heaven help us. Well, and what did those wars actually mean? What was, what was behind them? Who did they profit? Well, they profited many young men again. They profited many young men who thought about their souls and made a good confession before they died. They made very good use of the First and Second World Wars. How many were there? God knows. But what, what were those wars about? What, what was, it's necessary to think a little clearly about them because otherwise they, 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 they're two huge events of the, 19th century, of the 20th century. Which is, the century, which is the century that is the father of our own century, those two events shape the modern world to a huge extent. For whose benefit, humanly speaking, did they shape the world? Did they shape the world for, for Christianity? Well, it's very clear that the First World War got rid of the Catholic Kaiser in Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Catholic Kaiser was off his throne a few years after the war, so after the first, set first World War, the German Kaiser, who was a Protestant at least, not Catholic, Kaiser Wilhelm II, William II, he was exiled to Holland and died in Holland. Uh, the, 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 Kaiser, the Protestant Empire of, of Germany was um, was no more Catholic, was no more Christian, and of course, thirdly, the the Orthodox. The, the Russian Orthodox Tsar of Russia was murdered after the First World War. No, or during the First World War, <coughs> yeah, probably during. The First World War was still going on when he was hustled away to a back part of Russia and assassinated in a cellar by people who were going to take over Russia and devote it to communism for the next... And Russia would suffer brutally under communism for the next 70 years, thanks to the First World War. Who profited from the First World War? The enemies of Christ, surely one can say. It wasn't the friends of Christ who profited, except the soldiers who died and went to heaven instead of going to hell. And the Second World War, who profited from the Second World War? Well, the, friend, the American president said, the world, the world to make, the, the, a war to make the world safe for democracy. But you look at the results and you can say, it was rather to make the world safe for communism. It's communism that spread immensely thanks to the Second World War. Because an, an aim of the Americans was to bring to an end the British Empire and the French Empire. Two empires which were not democratic in the ideas of the Americans. So it was the world, it did in a way make the world safe for democracy, but what happened to all of those colonies that were liberated from, liberated from the empires? Did they become Christian or did many of them become communists? The Second World War certainly didn't promote anything religious. And it wasn't meant to, it wasn't designed to. These two wars, like so much in our wicked modern world, were designed to, to, serve, to serve the enemies of God, not his friends. Bank, bankers' wars, they have been called. 
was set up by the bankers in order to make the bankers even more rich and even more powerful. And that's what happened. That is surely what happened. Again, our Lord God writes straight with crooked lines. What we are seeing today is a religious revival in Russia, thanks without any question at all to the sufferings of 70 years under communism. So the enemies of God grab hold of Russia, they cruelly govern them for 70 years, then they, they, they're not wanted any longer, and the religion begins to come back. And the more the Russians suffered, the more the, more the religious revival of today. So you can say, you, know, you and I do not know, we do not know how God writes history. God is infinitely above us, and he is infinitely wiser than you or I, and he knows infinitely more than you or I. But uh, when we look at things down on the ground, they are not what the newspapers and the television and the politicians want us to think they are. And so now the Russians are seem to be defending the interests of, Christ, of Christians in Syria and elsewhere. And uh, where does it finish? How does it finish? It will finish partly in dependence upon our, on our prayers. We need to pray a great deal that world events take such a course that the largest possible number of souls be saved. And we need to pray for, the, for many, many souls that are going to die, either in war or in, in military war or in the throwing around of bombs, which is very liable to happen. Uh, we need to pray in advance that the many, many, many souls that are going to come before their maker, as many souls as possible, will be saved, that they will, they will find room for repentance before they, before they die. Mysteries of God, mysteries of God. Today, in any case, we pray for the soldiers who died for their country, brave young men. And many people say that, and it's surely a reasonable thing to say, that they're the kind, in a way, the, the best of, of European youth, the best of the European young men, were, or many of the best, were liquidated in those two wars, leaving room for the villains, leaving room for something rather less than the best of men to take over which is what we've seen since. In all of this is, is the perfect, the perfect justice of Almighty God and also His mercy. And His justice and His mercy are two sides of exactly the same coin. If He was not just, He wouldn't be merciful, He'd be sloppy. If He was not merciful, He wouldn't be just, He would be cruel. Justice without mercy is cruel, mercy without justice is sloppy. God is neither cruel nor sloppy, but he is both just and merciful. And he directs history in exactly that way. And it is he who is the master of history and not we ourselves. The, the men push things around, the men crush Russia and they think they're going to try and rule Russia forever. And then 70 years it's over and then Christ begins to come back. And he is, there is a serious religious revival in Russia as visitors to Russia will tell you, there are huge queues to venerate an icon, uh, one of the old icons in one of the rebuilt churches. Many churches have been rebuilt in Russia. Russia is a basically religious country. Communism was for Russia in 1917 a substitute religion. I think it's Pope Pius XI who called it the messianism of materialism. The messianism of materialism. There is a messianic dimension. Communism is a substitute religion. And it's when people have, not, have lost the true religion that they grasp after something like communism as a substitute religion. When you lose, when people lose the true religion, it leaves a big gap and, and something big is needed to fill that gap. And it has been communism. Today, com communism has morphed into globalism. And what is for many people today, and that's like the, the, the soft version and the hard version, Communism is the hard version, globalism is the soft version, but it's essentially the same thing. It's the, the, the messianism of materialism, a globalism just like communism. 
And people today believe in matter, they believe in money, they believe in comfort, they believe in things material, they believe in material goods. And the religion of material goods is, was communism, is now globalism. It's a substitute religion and of course it's no religion at all. It bears no relation to the true God. Except that it witnesses to the gap that's been left by the departure or by the being kicked out of the true God. So, my dear friends, let us uh, always, as Catholics, attempt to see things with the eyes of Almighty God. To see things in the perspective, for instance, of the Old Testament. If you want to see events in history the way Almighty God sees them, read the Old Testament and read the history of the people of, of Israel, of the Israelites. When they loved God and obeyed God, they prospered. And when they, when they turned away from God, he punished them. It's as simple as that. And his punishment, of course, is a mercy because a, no good parent leaves his children to do what they like and, and, and go to rot. A good parent chastises his children and, and keeps them off the rotten path and keeps them on the straight path, and disciplines them to keep them on the straight path. And if he doesn't discipline them, he doesn't love them. Discipline is the, is the proof of love, not the proof of harshness. And so, let us pray, pray and pray to Almighty God these days, these months, these years. Things are surely going to break loose again in the Third World War. It looks as though at a given moment, it may well be, surely I've said this before, I, I don't pretend to be infallible at, at, at questions of um, politics. It's only on doctrine, the unchanging doctrine of the church that a human being can be sure of being infallible. But uh, it looks as though uh, the West is at this moment provoking, provoking, provoking Russia to start the Third World War, so that the West can say, we didn't start it, it's Russia that are the aggressors. And so they're provoking, provoking. And at a given moment, the Russians may say, that's it, that's enough. That is enough. Enough of lies, enough of deceit, enough of hypocrisy and treachery. Enough. And they will, it, there are many prophecies they will invade Europe. And there are many prophecies they will conquer Europe. May, then maybe, at last, the consecration of Russia will be done. Then maybe the Russians, well, if the consecration is done, then the situation changes. And it's very possible that that's the moment when uh, the Russians become Catholic without completely, without being, becoming Latin. They will become Catholic without becoming Latin. The Latin form of Catholicism is not the only form of Catholicism. And, but the, 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 their Russian Orthodoxy will be purged, whatever is schismatic and heretical in it, and then it may well be that the Russians will lead, Russia will lead a, a religious revival in suffering, chastised, punished, and humiliated West. The, way the hum, humiliated and chastised West is possible. This is a scenario, my dear friends, it's not the certain truth. But today's memory of the two First World Wars um, evoke thoughts of what can be and what will be, what may be the Third World War. It is all in God's hands. Make sure that you pray and pray for, especially for, the conversion of as many, many souls as possible when the reality begins to bite. So that as many, many souls may be saved instead of throwing themselves into eternal hell. Pray especially, of course, to the Mother of God. Pray especially the Holy Rosary. And pray especially the five first Saturdays. Every soul that does the five first Saturdays and does them well is going to help to obtain the grace of the poor Pope, be it this one or his successor, the poor Pope, to um, perform the consecration of Russia in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.